Uh, uh, yeah, that's, that's right. That's my name. Uh, and there's a wonderful mouse pointer. It's gone now. Okay, so uh, my name is Johannes, and I'm part of Monochrome. And Monochrome is an art, technology, and philosophy collective based in, uh, uh, in Austria. And uh, that's how Austria looks like. It's a wonderful, nice country, but we try to step ahead and go to different places on our nice little planet to do different projects. So what is Monochrome doing? Monochrome is a group of context hackers, I would call it. Context hackers means we try to find the best context and the best medium for a certain message. So we are looking for the best weapon of mass distribution. And because we are leftists, we are actually postmodern leftists, and we're a little bit melancholic, so we try to find the best medium to spread a certain political message or idea. And sometimes it's a book, Sometimes it's a musical about the banking software. Sometimes it's uh, a sock puppet show about communist sock puppets. Or sometimes it's a sex machine. Or uh, it's a computer game. Whatever. We try to find the perfect medium. Uh, and we deal with subversion a lot. We're actually experimenting with and about subversion. So what is subversion? Let's jump back a couple of decades to politics, art, and the Viennese actionists. The Viennese actionists were a pretty interesting group of artists in the 50s, 60s, and 70s in Austria, and they did pretty biz uh, bizarre things. They painted with blood, they uh, shed into a college auditorium and got onto the front newspaper of one of Austria's biggest newspapers back then. Uh, it was quite interesting what they did because they provoked society. They wanted to get a reaction. And that was pretty easy uh, back then in the 60s in Austria. Uh, Viennese actionists, please tag it and tweet it. Okay. Uh, nowadays, most of the stuff they did in the 60s and 70s. If you would do it nowadays, you can be happy that someone takes a picture and puts it on Flickr, if you're happy, okay? So what changed? Back then, uh, we didn't have Jackass. <laughs> Jackass nowadays is by far more uh, hardcore than anything the Viennese actionists ever did. Uh, the main wonderful thing the Viennese actionists still had in the 50s and 60s was the so-called disciplinary society, as uh, Foucault calls it. So a disciplinary society is a society that tells you what you should not do. A disciplinary society is a society where you know your boundaries, your borders. And the Viennese actionists knew they shouldn't jump over a certain border or boundary, and they did it, and that was that pretty much like provoked society to react to it. The interesting thing about a disciplinary society is that you knew about the boundaries. You knew what you should not do. You knew that there will be a reaction to that. You just had to dare to do it. There were clear hierarchies, and you could subvert the clear hierarchies. Because if you knew the hierarchies, you could just like fuck with them. Okay? So, uh, you knew that there are stop signs, and you creatively disobeyed the stop signs. Uh, nowadays, we live in a society of control. A society of control is completely differently organized, because the stop signs are not out there, the stop signs are in our heads. That's the main problem. And if the stop signs are in our heads, and you control yourself, you do not subvert yourself. How can you subvert yourself? If you live in a, uh, in a wonderful Western uh, liberal society as we, then we think we have all the possibilities. There are no hierarchies. There are no boundaries. I'm a good friend of my boss. But still, I mean, the hierarchies still exist. The control society actually tricks you into believing that the hierarchies are gone. But they are not. And that's the main problem. Uh, just a brief, um, like... It's almost, it sounds like a joke, actually. When uh, the Roman Catholic Church uh, still was actively fighting against masturbation, they, it was pretty clear. They said, that's a disciplinary society. They said, masturbation is bad, you'll go to hell for that. 
Nowadays, they kind of say something like, be responsible about your use of masturbation. <laughs> and if you think about being responsible about your use of masturbation in your head, then it's, it's over. <laughs> okay? That's soft control and that's a society of control. Okay? So, uh, we did an interesting piece of work called the Viennese Factionists. And what we did is, we uh, had a rustic Austrian wine tavern uh, and we were waiting there and uh, drinking wine and we also could order, beside other wonderful Austrian dishes, we could order a blood sausage made out of our own blood, okay? And that's what we did. We were sitting there, we gave our own blood, we paid money for it, we spilled a little bit of it, and oh, yuck! And people were staring at us, and he was making the sausage, and he cooked the sausage, and we ate the sausage with horseradish and mustard, uh, and we kind of liked it. And he was happy, and we all want to be part of the blood group, so whatever, okay? The main problem now is, although you're laughing, Fail! Major fail! Why? Because nowadays it doesn't work like that. We do not live in a disciplinary society any longer, so it's completely useless to do stuff like that. I could probably eat a Chinese embryo and would provoke some kind of reaction, but it doesn't work like that. If you want to subvert society, if you want to subvert the structure of a control society, you have to be very tricky. And art provocation, like eating your own blood sausage, might, might be interesting on a, on a personal level, but on a political level, it doesn't, it doesn't work. So, uh, let's tell you a wonderful story about how we tried to subvert subversion, or we actually, how we stumbled into subverting subversion. Uh, around 10 years ago, a wonderful thing happened in Austria. It was a shift, a wonderful political shift in Austria. Uh, for the first time ever, uh, the conservatives teamed up with uh, the so-called Freedom Party, and yeah, Freedom Party, you can imagine what that is, okay? So the conservatives teamed up with um, the, the right-wing uh, right populists and formed a coalition in Austria for the first time ever. There was a massive outcry about that. Uh, the civil society was reacting to that. Uh, and it was quite interesting to see people on the streets demonstrating for years pretty much. And uh, during this whole process of like revolting against what's going on uh, on the political, uh, macro-political level, uh, we got a phone call. This phone call was quite interesting. It was a phone call uh, by a curator and she asked us, hey Monochrome, uh, I'm curating uh, the Austrian uh, piece for the biennial in Sao Paulo, and I would like to have you, monochrome guys, uh, to be the official Austrian representatives at the biennial in Sao Paulo. And we said, hey, that's pretty interesting, that's actually pretty cool, thanks a lot. Uh, you may not forget, the biennial in Sao Paulo is the third largest art um, festival on the planet. There is the Documenta in Castle, there is the biennial in Venice, and then there is the biennial in Sao Paulo. It's pretty much the only important one in the southern hemisphere, which tells you a lot about the state of our stupid planet, okay? So uh, we said, that's very interesting that you want to invite us to represent Austria uh, in uh, Sao Paulo, but we can't do that. Not, you know, like, no, no, we cannot represent this, like, bullshit that's going on here. We will not do that. And then she said, please think about it a little bit longer. We have cash for you. And because we are artists, we said, how much cash? And she said, blah, blah, blah. Mm, OK, let's think about it. Good. Uh, and then we said, yes, let's do it. Uh, but but uh, can we send someone else? And she asked, well, you like, like a subcontractor or something? And we said, yeah. And she said, whatever, just do it, okay? And then we sent out a press release uh, that we found an artist, Georg Paul Thoman, to send uh, to the Biennial in Sao Paulo as the official Austrian representative. Uh, and uh, the newspapers reported about that and wrote about the whole thing. Uh, the only problem was that Georg Paul Thoman doesn't exist. Uh, they didn't do their Google searches, I guess. Journalists, you know. So. Uh, suddenly, a non-existent artist that nobody knew that he doesn't exist uh, was the official Austrian representative at the Biennial in Sao Paulo, Georg Paul Thoman, and that's how he looks like. Okay, uh, it's uh, it's a wonderful piece of art. It's called Material Study with a Scanned Photo of Self in a Beer Mood and Photoshop Crystallization Filter, 2001, and. Uh, 
the main work, the main work we did pretty much was writing his 500-page biography, where we packed 40 years of art history, tech history, and cultural history into this stupid Austrian art asshole called Georg Paul Thoman, okay? And uh, it's for you, a present. Uh, but don't drop it on your toe, it will break it. Uh, yeah, so that's Georg Paul Thoman, and suddenly he was the official Austrian representative at the Biennale in Sao Paulo, a wonderful building, and that's his piece of art. It's a self-portrait as Austria's highest mountain, the Grossglockner. Uh, and <laughs> what happened is we were there as the official Austrian representatives, not. Uh, we were the technical support team of Georg Paul Thoman. And because we were the technical support team, drilling holes and putting the stuff up, and uh, nobody gave a shit about us. Because in a big art superstructure like the Biennial, the least people you talk to are like the bottom of the hierarchy, the technical support teams. We were no one. Nobody gave us business cards and spread their germs and stuff, and it was kind of relieving. So we were there, setting up the stuff. People came by, oh, that's a really bad piece of art. It's from 1980s. I want to talk to this Georg Paul Thoman. He has to tell me about it. And we said, we don't know where Georg Paul Thoman is. He's probably in his hotel room. You could call there. He's probably watching the porn channel or whatever. I do not know. Uh, and actually, we do not care. He's paying badly. And we are not even sure if we set the piece up correctly. He never shows up. Whatever. Uh, so many, many more people came and asked about the whole thing, and we didn't know, nah. Uh, and then we had this interesting idea of, well, I mean, we're the best friends of the technical support teams. That's the people we hang out all the time. We could actually tell them about the whole story. So we told our friends of the other technical support teams about Georg Paul Thoman, that it was a political uh, motivated piece of, of art. And they were really interested, and they really liked it. Because for the first time ever, they knew more than all the super-duper curators above them and the biennial board, and woo! And they really liked it. And we told them, I mean, the information is out there, you have it now. We do not forbid you to tell what you learned now. Just tell whatever you like to whoever you like. And suddenly, there were gazers of rumors bursting out everywhere. And the technical support teams were telling stories. Some of them were pretty bad, like that Tolman had sex with uh, the curator, top curator's wife in some restroom. And who knows, yeah? <laughs> kind of sexist, you know, technical guys. Uh, but um, it was nice. Uh, and people came back to us and said, I thought that your piece is shit, but it's really cool, I've heard the story. And we didn't even know which story, okay? Uh, so, uh, Georg Paul Thoman was filled with interesting life. Uh, and what happened was that uh, we tried to talk to all the other artists, and they were not really interested. Because the main problem of a biennial of the white cube is, there's a white cube, and another white cube, and another white cube, and, and they sit like, like bees in their small hives, and they think they're so cool and liberal and creative, and they're just like Coke cans. They're just like, uh, uh, you know, like scarce Coke cans. Uh, and uh, we had no contact to most of the artists, uh, but we got a letter in our mailbox. We had our own mailbox, and we got a letter by the Taiwanese representative, Chen Chi Chung. And we read the letter and couldn't really understand what he was talking about, so we went to his cube and asked uh, Chen Chi Chung, what's going on? And he told us the story that he was in trouble. Uh, uh, on the outside of the wall of the biennial, like, white cubes, there was pretty much like the name of the artist and the country, like Georg Paul Thoman and Austria, in our case. In his case, it was Chen Chi Chung and Taiwan. And someone, overnight, had removed the Taiwan and replaced it by Taipei Museum of Fine Arts. And he didn't know what was going on. He was assigned as the official Taiwanese representative like two years before that. He was really looking forward to do that. And his piece of work was really, really critical about Taiwan. It was dealing with uh, humanitarian problems in mental institutions in Taiwan. That's really bad stuff. And it was important for him to be the national representative of Taiwan. So what, what happened to his country? It, uh, uh, so he didn't know what's going on. He tried to talk to any top curators, any board members, nothing. Administration was blocking off, no communication, and he didn't know what to do, and he actually wanted to leave. And uh, we told him, hey, we'll try to find out what's going on and try to help you, a little form of solidarity in this like non solidaric art world here. So we asked our technical support guys, friends, and did some research, and we found out that China had intervened. China had told uh, 
uh, the administration. Oh, Taiwan has its own national representation here, one China policy. There is no Taiwan, okay? And if Taiwan stays here, then we cause massive, massive diplomatic trouble, and uh, you do not want to have that, don't you, Biennial? And then they said, well, okay, we don't want to, yeah. The Taiwanese guy can be happy to be here anyways. Okay, fine. Just like remove his, na his country's name and replace it by his museum. It's fine. Of course, it's not fine. So we tried to find out what we could do. And what we did is, yeah, you see Georg Paul Thoman, Austria. We removed the T. It's Austria, still a nice country. And we had a T. And then we went to Canada. Canada, you have three A's. You don't need three A's. And then we got an A, and then we went to Puerto Rico, and so on, and so on, and collected letters, and still, wow, Taiwan! There it is. So we collected letters and put it on the outside of his wall. A little bit campy, but it worked. And uh, Chen Chichang was so happy about the whole situation that he didn't leave. So many uh, photographers and journalists showed up, took pictures of that, did interviews with him. And uh, a couple of days later, something wonderful happened. Uh, we got a copy of the Taipei Times, one of the biggest newspapers in Taiwan. And they had a headline. And the headline was, Austrian artist Georg Paul Thoman saves Taiwan. So a non-existing artist saves a country that should not exist. I mean, that's as, that's as radical as postmodernism can get. Or, uh, so it was really wonderful, and that's pretty much what I'm talking about. If you want to prank the system, you have to be as complex as the system itself. If you can combine, if you can summarize your prank, your political action, into one line that fits on CNN, it's the wrong way to do it. Uh, just in case, do it yourself. I have 12 Facebook accounts, and one of the Facebook accounts uh, is a white Aryan supremacist girl living in Montana. Uh, and nobody knows that I am that girl. And it's interesting to see how many friends she has and what they talk about. So, yeah, Georg Paul Thoman was a wonderful project. Uh, a couple of years later, we killed him. <laughs> I want to believe, and we buried him uh, uh, in a yard. Uh, Thanks a lot. My, uh, that's, yeah, that's a URL. You can check out the bi biography and all that stuff. Uh, my name is Johannes Grenzwirt, and I'm part of Monochrome. Follow me on Twitter or whatever you like. It was a pleasure talking to you. Have a nice evening. <laughs>